Hi, my name is Andrew Sharp. I'm a consultant cardiologist from the University Hospital of Wales in Cardiff in the United Kingdom. And I'm going to talk today about the results of the Radiance TRIO study, the key takeaways and the implications for hypertension treatment. So ultrasound-based renal denervation is a very interesting technology. Uh, it's delivered via a six-inch guiding catheter to the renal artery over a wire, and it uses a balloon to orient an ultrasound emitter, uh, which delivers ultrasound into the periadventitial fat where the renal sympathetic nerves live. The ultrasound heats that fat and denervates uh, the kidney that's being treated. It does so with only three denervations per side, lasting about seven seconds each. And it utilizes water that circulates through a closed system into the balloon that orients the uh, ultrasound emitter, such that the near field stays cool, and therefore there's no endothelial injury in the near field. And yet the ultrasound targets the periadventitial fat where the renal sympathetic nerves live, denervating them safely and effectively. So you can see in the bottom left-hand corner here, some a thermal gel model, and you see how you get a very circular uh, denervation effect in the periadventitial fat, but you have sparing of the near field. This can be done with only seven seconds of energy delivery per uh, sonication. And that happens three times on the left, three times on the right, if there's space in the main renal artery to do it. And you can deliver into accessories uh, of a certain size. So the Radiance HTN TRIO two-month data have recently been released at ACC, and so we can recap on them here. The basics of the trial design, uh, this may be familiar to you as it's a, a trial design that's been rehearsed throughout this field for the last uh, few years. So we started off with patients with an office blood pressure of 140 over 90 or more on three or more antihypertensive drugs. Uh, but one of the interesting things about HTN uh, TRIO is that we took them off those individual meds and put them onto a fixed dose three drug combination pill, which was an angiotensin receptor blocker, a calcium channel blocker, and a thiazide drug all in one. Therefore, if they took one pill, we guaranteed adherence to all three. Uh, they then were assessed with ambulatory blood pressure monitoring and they had to have a daytime ambulatory blood pressure of greater than or equal to 135 over 85 on this fixed pill. Uh, and then they underwent pre-procedural imaging with CT or MRA to make sure that they were suitable for the study and to map out their design so we could plan the procedure. Subsequently, they were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to either renal denervation or a sham with the primary endpoint at two months. So here are the results. Uh, so in the intention to treat population, um, we had a drop in uh, daytime ambulatory systolic blood pressure in the renal denervation arm of about eight millimeters, and then in the sham arm of about three millimeters. Now, what's interesting about this is apart from this uh, statistically significant and important blood pressure reduction uh, between the two arms uh, is that there was a slight imbalance in loss of data in the ambulatory blood pressure arm. So when we look at those who actually had ambulatory blood pressure and therefore we could uh, define their primary endpoint, we had a, a bit more impressive of a blood pressure reduction at 9.7 uh, millimeters in the RDN arm and three in the sham arm. So I think these results are somewhat in keeping with the background of uh, ultrasound technology results. Um, we have a number of studies here uh, that over the years have shown the effectiveness of ultrasound-based renal denervation. Uh, the SOLO study was published in The Lancet a couple of years ago and showed an 8.5 millimeter reduction in daytime ambulatory systolic blood pressure at two months. The crossover patients within that arm uh, easily matched that at 11.2 millimeters of mercury on ambulatory blood pressure during the day. TRIO fits in nicely there with a intention to treat arm of eight millimeters of mercury. And then we have ACHIEVE and then radio sound with the final being an open label study um, showing a 13 millimeter reduction. So I think we're seeing a fairly consistent pattern here. This is the effect size of the order of one or two antihypertensive drugs, depending on which end of this spectrum that we get from. Uh, and therefore, with these sorts of blood pressure reductions, uh, we're expecting to see reductions in the risk of stroke of over a quarter, uh, maybe a little higher, uh, if these were achieved with either lifestyle measures or with drugs. Uh, and so I, I think when you look at the consistency of the results we've seen from the Radiance program, uh, we see in the SOLO study, uh, a drop in blood pressure of about eight and a half millimeters of mercury. And then when you add that to a fixed combination triple pill in a very rigorously conducted study, uh, we see a very similar amount of blood pressure reduction showing that not only does ultrasound based real denervation reduce blood pressure in the absence of medications, it can do so in a very difficult group, a group who 
have proved refractory to three or more medicines. And even when you put them on a triple pill, which is really the highest standard of pharmacology care uh, when you're talking about three drugs, um, we are still able to further reduce blood pressure by clinically important amounts. And I think it's worth just re-emphasizing that this is ambulatory blood pressure, this isn't office pressure. And therefore, uh, these are quite potent blood pressure reductions that I think are an attractive uh, introduction and addition to the field. Well, this is the key question. The demand for devices in hypertension is coming principally from patients. Patients have been telling us for decades that they don't like drugs. And how do we know this? Well, we've had many, many drug classes, at least 17 in normal daily use in most countries, and there are more available on the market with which to treat blood pressure. And if you put patients on three or four drugs, most of them will get to target. And yet, if you look at recent data from America, fewer than 50% of patients with hypertension are at target. And we've had the same sort of results from London practices published recently, uh, showing about 50% control rates for hypertension in the United Kingdom. So why is it that we've diagnosed hypertension, we've counseled patients on the risks, We've offered them drugs and yet they're not at target. And the answer is that patients don't like taking drugs a lot of the time. These are patients who have been told that they may have heart attack or stroke or even death from their hypertension. But the problem is that is a far distant concept to them in that they may not uh, develop one of those events for, for years or even decades. And yet they're being asked to take pills on a daily basis that may make them feel worse. So calcium channel blockers may give them ankle swelling, uh, ACE inhibitors may give them a cough, Diuretics make them constantly look for toilets when they're out and about in public. Uh, beta blockers have got a uh, side effect list as long as my arm. So we are giving patients a, a series of tablets for an asymptomatic condition to try and prevent a problem that may not come for many years down the line. So patients would like to avoid those events, but they don't necessarily want the day-to-day -day burden of pharmacotherapy, either the psychological or physical burden. Now, drugs are fantastic for high blood pressure. But when you're only having 50% control rates in the United Kingdom published last year, and fewer than 50% of American uh, patients with hypertension are at control on a recent study and the numbers are actually falling, then patient populations are telling us something. Now, Roland Schmieder has assessed this in a German hypertensive population. He's uh, surveyed 1,000 patients with hypertension. And about half of them or more were willing to consider a device as part of their treatment even though it's, it's relatively early on in its evolution. So I think that tells us that there's a demand for this sort of treatment. Uh, we've demonstrated in five studies listed here on this slide in solo, solo crossover, in trio, achieve, and in radio sound, a, a potent blood pressure reduction from a single procedure that takes about 40 minutes to do. Uh, it can be done easily as a day case procedure. And then the, subsequently, the patients can get on with their lives. And if they are a responder, uh, then we're talking about the equivalent of one or two drugs worth of blood pressure reduction that will last for years and potentially forever. We, we won't know that for decades to come, but we're seeing no signal of attenuation from renal denervation in following a successful procedure. So uh, I think there's a lot of very important questions that have to be asked of this technology. We've now answered the question of efficacy. We've seen efficacy in patients who are not on pills, and we've seen efficacy in people who are on pills. We've seen safety. So now, where does it come in? Well, uh, you've got some very attractive groups. So those who have a very high cardiovascular risk, if we're achieving 8 to 11 point reductions in ambulatory blood pressure, the actual risk reduction in those patients will be quite significant. So of course, they'll have a relative risk reduction of over 25% in things like stroke and heart failure, but the actual risk reduction will be higher, the higher the baseline level of risk for the patient. So I think they're an attractive group to look at. We've also got young patients who are facing 40 to 50 years of drug treatment if they develop primary hypertension after comprehensive investigation to rule out secondary causes. They're an attractive group. But I think no matter what, what physicians say, who we say should have denervation, I think this affects so many people and they are looking for new options that I think the answer to this question is going to come from patients and patient representatives. And I, I really think that both physicians and uh, healthcare bodies need to listen to those groups and hear what they have to say before we make a final decision on uh, who has access to this new and important procedure. Thanks very much for the invite and for listening to the results of the Radiance Trio study.